Hello, everyone. Welcome to the event tonight. What is anti-racist writing? This event is co-sponsored by the Writing Forward Reading Series in conjunction with the Santa Clara University English Department and the Santa Clara Review. Just some information about our sponsors. The Santa Clara Review is a student-edited literary magazine which publishes poetry, fiction, nonfiction, hybrid, and visual art. The magazine is published biannually in February and May, drawing on submissions from Santa Clara University students, faculty, staff, as well as from writers around the nation and globe. And so anyone here is eligible um, to submit. The Writing Forward Reading Series specifically brings creative writers with international, national, and regional reputations to the campus. English majors and minors actively engage in planning and organizing the series, which gives undergraduates hands-on experience in the fields of writing, publishing, and public relations. And of course, to convene together a group of folks who are interested in pressing questions, not just about the field of writing, but about the impact of writing itself. Tonight's event is a platform for folks to share their writing and ideas. And I just want to impress upon everyone, this is an inclusive space that values all. We have a zero tolerance policy when it comes to xenophobia, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, racism, bullying, and or ableism. We will treat each other with respect at all times. Violation of any of these aforementioned guidelines will result in being dismissed from the event via the discretion of the hosts, namely myself. So now let's get to the love. This event will feature four dynamos in literary and scholarly culture. Tongo Aysen Martin, Ty Freedom Ford, Asao Inouye, and Thea Matthews. What a year we're having. And I'm sure there is plenty of anxiety about its remainder currently looming over us with this upcoming election and its windfall. We have seen an eruption of hate speech, of violence, and divisive proclamations by our national leaders. But let's not kid ourselves. It has always existed. However, as a result of several factors, including the advent of social media discourse and media outlets that enable anonymities, the impact of such odium has felt more urgent, more insistent to many Americans. Though for many, it has always felt this way. The recent response to this hateful rhetoric, however, has also been dynamic, with nation and worldwide protests, demonstrations, exhibitions, seminars, murals, workshops, dining room table discussions, and perhaps even tonight's event. The term anti-racism has been uttered in American mouths perhaps more than ever before. And like all words in a language, they evolve, expand, shape to context, become something of their time. Investigations of what constitutes racism appear in live chats all over the country. Books with anti-racism racism in the title shoot to the top of the bestseller list. And the subject has once again become more central to the decisions many make in their political and social dealings. And while this effort can be perceived as encouraging, and we hope in our hearts that it is, there is also worry that the complexity of such a practice be whittled in the national lexicon down to buzzwords and Twitter bites, to be narrowed into singularity instead of examined for its multitude. Tonight is about inviting possibility of celebrating the complex of anti-racism. For this event, the four participants were asked to have prepared a 10 to 15 minute response to the question, what is anti-racist writing? That is all. However they have decided to answer this question is up to them. It can be expository, it can be lyrical, it can be performative, it can be contrapuntal, or anything beyond or in between. We've invited these four writers because of the thoughtful and varied ways they negotiate this question to take on its multitude. And therefore, instead of thinking about 
defining what is anti-racist writing, we are attempting to expand the notion of what that could mean. Each writer will be introduced and then we'll present their response. And then afterward, we will enable the chat so that folks may ask questions for a brief q and Is everyone ready? All right. First up is Tongo Eisen Martin. Tongo Eisen Martin was born in San Francisco, California and received a master's from Columbia University. He is the author of Someone's Dead Already, which was nominated for a California Book Award and Heaven is All Goodbyes, which received the California Book Award and an American Book Award. A poet, movement worker, and educator, his latest curriculum on extrajudicial killing of black people, we charge genocide again, has been used as an educational and organizing tool throughout the country. Please welcome Tongo. Thanks. And follow them to the station of my enemy. A cobalt tooth man pitches pennies at my mugshot negative. All over the United States, there are toddlers in the rock. I see why everyone out here got in the big cosmic basket and why blood agreements mean a lot and why I get shot back at. I understand the psycho spiritual refusal to write white history or take the glass freeway. White skin tattooed on my right forearm Ricochet sewage near where I collapsed into a rat infested manhood. My new existence is living graffiti in the kitchen with a lot of gun cylinders to hack up. House of God in part, no cops in part. My body brings down the Christmas. The new bullets, pray over blankets made from the old bullets. Pray over the 28th hour's next beauty mark, extrajudicial Confederate statue restoration the waistband before the next protest poster, by the way. Time is not an illusion, Your Honor. I will save your desk for last. You are witty, Your Honor. You're moving money again, Your Honor. It is only raining one thing, non-white cops. And prison guard shadows reminded me of spoiled milk flowing on an oil spill, a neighborhood making a lot of fuss over its demise, a new late for a Black Panther party. Malcolm X's ballroom jacket slung over my son's shoulder, the figment of village, a new noose to a new white preacher, all in an abstract painting of a president. They bought slavery some time, didn't it? The tantric screeches of military bolts and election Tuesday cars, a cold-blooded study in leg irons, proof that some white people have actually fondled nooses. As sundown couples made their vows of love over opaque peace plastic and bolt action audiences, you know, the Medgar ever second, is definitely my favorite law of science. Final news clippings and primitive Methodists, my arm changes imperialisms. Simple policing versus structural frenzies. Elementary school script versus even wider white spectrums. Heartless bleeding in the challenge of watching civilians think at terrible rituals they have around the corner. They let their elders beg for public mercy. I'm gonna go ahead and sharpen these kids' heads and the arrows myself and see how much gravy spills out of family crest. Modern fans of what, what, what with their t-shirt poems and t-shirt guilt and me having on the cheapest pair of shoes on the bus, I have no choice but to read the city walls for signs of my life. I'm off to make a church bell out of a bank window. Man, kitchens might've meant more to the masses back in the day. Before that, we had no enemy. Somewhere in America, the prison bus is running on time. You want to lose your job before revolution hits. Somewhere I won't be home for breakfast. Everyone out here now knows my name and I won't be turned against for at least four months. The cop in the picking line is a hard working rookie. The sign in my hands getting more and more laughs. It says the picking line got cops in it. <laughs> I can take care of those windows for you if you want, but someone else got to go inside your gas tank. It was clear to the man that rich people had talked too much this year. Uh, why, why don't you go ahead and throw down that marble park bench everyone's looking up at? You know, get the Romans out of your mind. It may be a good night's sleep with a change the last 20 years of my life, playing the instruments like punching the wall. What would you have me do? Replace the population, give brotherhood back to the winter, stop smoking cigarettes with the barely dead. You know, they listen in on the Sabbath. Police called the police on me. There was a white candlestick beneath my detention. I ruined the soup again, thought the judge, as he took off his pilgrim robe behind the white people's door and more. I didn't get lucky. I got what was coming to me. He told us, they fight me back, the man said. Of course, to himself, washing windows with a will to live. 
Tin can on his left shoulder, enjoying the bright brand new blight with all party goers, both supernatural and supernaturally down to earth. Uh, what is this elevator? Traveling side to side, like 1,000 bitter Polaroid pictures that you actually try to eat all the furniture on this street, nailed to the cement. Cheap furniture, but we have commitment. This morning, an essay opens the conversation between enemies. You know why? Because you control every grain of processed sugar between here and a poor person's border. Because in the tin can on my left shoulder, I can hear the engines of deindustrialization. You should get into painting, you know, tell lies more deeply. And this month, I'm rooting for the trader. Uh, carting cement to my pillow here, we will build them high again, not talking much. And once you climb up the organ pipe to our apartment floor, I'm high again, calling everything church. Sing along to a courtyard, thanks to a horn player's holy pastime. And I'm just putting a real jacket on it, you know, talk about a real five years. Keep memories like these in the pocket. Next to the tall receipt, that man lost a wager with the God of good causes. I mean, stood up for himself a little too late, Shit, maybe too early. I could still see 20 angles of his jaw zigzagging through the cold world of deindustrialization. There's an art to it. I will tell my closest friends one day, capitalists eat until the world is blurry to them. These streets are made of saliva. Some people made of saliva too. They usually have on uniforms while a crazy man spins round and round trying to make a record out of this mass production jungle. Maybe I'll join them, count cash and cry. You know, these streets are made of saliva and white sheets are worn by a building in which kids are supposed to learn how to read well. White sheets on the highway too. Another mirror needs their head on a pike. One down is just one down. But if you tell all this to the masses, your teacher will pipeline you. They told me I was jewelry. They told me this is jungle. Well, maybe not jungle, more like 50 machine guns planted in the ground. It's raining faces again in California. What does this say about heaven? What does it say about the people you kill? Weight lines got so exhausted, a million minds dropped all these faces at once. If the fascists can read the lips of a giant talking in his sleep, man, we might as well make our demands in prison letters. Today was born the most important trigger finger in the world. Today I begun counting down the pages between now and a pile of books by a tunnel. Chicago is gonna walk out of Chicago one day. Babies are dragged street signs like old toys. Today, the most important letter left prison. Babies are laughing flags like faces that have disappeared. Maybe I'll join them, but for now, these streets are made of saliva and we raise half full glasses to the basements that meant nothing. And then the working poor who live there, we get shot, we get white sheets on California where the kitchen table likes to talk as much as the wall. And romance on the porch consists of hard resigning. I mean, it's picture characters talk spit. And know that they hard to kill, the kitchen table knows this. The porch is almost convinced that one down is just one down. This town is coming to town. A circus watching itself. Half distracted, half suicidal, thrilled children dressed as cops. Thrilled children are preaching their police and their intake and they're hiring and snatching your money. This town's coming to town with tough trademarks to follow. Today I watched capitalism walk on water and people play dead so that they could be part of a miracle. I talk facing away from the dead. They replaced me with the change in my pocket. <laughs> a penny that's yet to be invented, they say. You have to know how to cut a throat on the way to cutting a throat. After sleeping on a mattress made from two garbage bags of clothes, <laughs> I became content with the small gestures of plantation fires. Playing with couch ashes, I realized how weird the universe was. You know, it exists in so many places, man. so many random things. It interrupts me while I'm trying to dream like your clay correspondence, Lord. To be transparent, I have 20 books next to a bullet, like an old man giving advice at the beginning of a revolution. I've really done it, Lord. Explored the mumbles of my mind, explored what's naturally there, and I found no brainwashing. I found Africa, Lord. I have a future. It takes place in the diaspora South. I have morning possessions, modern militancy. I mean, when those to the South, I'll walk on a missile for food. I guess, I guess you will not want flowers for a few years, Lord. Will I be tied face to face with the country I murdered merged with its Lord? Our old metal versus new metal, our old metal versus a pool of meandering imperialist faces, a multiculturalism of source. The dead replaced me with a comedian's chest cavity instead of a chest cavity held tight. It takes a violent middle man for me to talk to myself. Stories that travel through other people's stories. A song about a song, a hemisphere about a hemisphere. Stories that travel through a conquered poet. You know, my mother remembers Africa, Lord. She killed on behalf of you, Lord. I wore a machete all winter and no one asked me what it meant. I read 1,000 books in front of the world. You know, what I do is fight poems and sleep through decking in San Francisco prayer circles, watch people play for post-working class associative surfaces and recreations of a governor's desk, ruling class art of utility, playing fine a sociopathic bureaucrat. A day so white people scare even easier. TV in a basket next to a ceramic baby, wearing ceramic armor, musket progeny fantasizing through the art of the poor, their trendy latches locked before a guy, black art hunted down like a dog. A hand over my friends, Lord. Lord, I think I'm gonna die in a war. 
unelected white people in my small house like a boot song with no spiritual effect, a dollhouse ace bomb, a pony show near dead bodies, apartheid weddings that go right, apartheid white people who give birth to mathematicians, the spiritual continuity of barracks and police stations, a chemical interpretation of a Sunday trip to church, church smells in their pockets, a river mistaken for a talking river, no autobiography outside of small personal victories of violence and drug use made in the image of God's trinkets with white abolitionists confided in their children about chemical assurances that they will switch from black artists to white artists, from black God to white God, from black worker to white worker. I think about you cautiously, Lord. In the same way I think about my childhood. Foxhole Friday nights, most of life is new to comedian points out of planners field to a priest. King Sugar Cane, King Cotton King, revolutionary to Bali Central. Containing almost a shallow introduction, introducing an unlisted planner class speaking about fevers and balance sheets and reassuring the masses that we could figure out our fathers later. Man, a priest took my mother lightly, Lord. Stood in front of the parishioners, re raveling fantasies about black art. Priest reading confidently before I broke him and broke his parallel. And after today, I've never been a poet before. Little brother watches his big brother's friends. They bring rifles on shelter walls. They agree with me and call it literature, man. It's a simple matter, this revolution thing. To really lie to no one. To keep nothing godlike. To write a poem for God. Right on. <laughs> um, <laughs> so concludes the <laughs> so so concludes the poem uh, or uh, the preamble. Um, to a, to a, to to some real uh, to, to some <laughs> some I got some brief good news and bad news, um, the the or real news, um, is that basically where we find ourselves now is this is just late stage imperialism, okay, um, meaning there's nowhere else to go there's no there's there's nowhere else to colonize. Um, the, the ruling class had a major psychic break uh, probably decades ago when uh, they, they, they decided that in order to save their nest eggs, they were gonna have to move production um, elsewhere. And in doing so, basically put a, 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 a set, set a, a timer to, to a detonation um, of sorts. Um, where basically everybody has less and less and less incentive of participating in this United States thing. You know, before there was the, you know, you, you had you had a working class opportunity. Um that 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 that's gone. Now what you see is the erosion actually of a petty bourgeois opportunity to where cats even in college have nowhere, there's there's nothing on the other side. And so when, whenever a society moves into a point where it's just, where, where the social contradictions are not tenable, where basically where nobody has any reason to play along, what happens? It gets hyper-militaristic, hyper-militarized, super fascist, super corporate, <laughs> super, super distracted, and there's a massive bloodletting, right? Only this time around, instead of you know, instead of the 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 um, the ecological comfort zone, or or e almost like the, the 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 ecological parachute that they had in the '40s when when millions and millions of people died, of, you know, uh, with a, say a fascist Germany or something like that. Now there is none. So now the planet itself, the biosphere itself, is a wrap. So what you have is just like you you had we, we have this situation in which we're really which we truly are careening towards oblivion. You see just the response to COVID, how they feel about you, right? They they're really ready to sacrifice millions of people uh, just to keep their just to keep their various hamster wheels turning. Okay, so um, you know. <laughs> to quote Malcolm X, it's not the time is running out, time is run out. <laughs> and, and, and so the the what 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 then is the task? What what is our task actually is kind of and, and I'm not trying to be cute, um, but anti-racist doesn't even begin to cover it. Because really what you know who who keeps skating by 
is the ruling class. We have to understand this is not just some metaphysical system. It's not just capitalism as it, or even use it to say imperialism, which is just in, in, in the classic terms, the higher stage of capitalism, what imperialism actually means or, or denotes. Um, but it's, 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 it's not like we're fighting these, this, uh, you don't fight an ideology. You fight people who are using the ideology to maintain their power, okay? So if I was to call myself anti-anything, I think I'm an anti-ruling class writer. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because we have we have we have definite, or they say uh, in conclusion, we have we have def we we I mean, do you feel ruled? I feel ruled, you know what I mean? We have a definite ruling class that needs that 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 needs to be um that needs to be um uh dethroned. Um, and, and, and that regardless of craft, regardless of what you practice, um, is what that, that reality is what you have to synthesize anything you do with, because it's just, it's, it's over with, and, 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 and I, and I see like relatively younger folks in, in here and, it, and, and I feel so bad because I mean, I'm like, like y'all, y'all just don't, y'all don't get the 10. 10 years I got, you know, my little, my little sub little generation, hey, uh, like we, we had, we, we could, you know, we could kind of play it. We could play with the individualism. We could have an individualistic adventure. Y'all can't, you know? So in, 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 con in conclusion, um, anti whatever is really just what's your life practice, right? And, 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 and making sure that, it, it, and really, what's your human practice? How are you being a human being? And really how it was the first order of business if we're gonna be human beings will be uh, defending and, and, and reanimating the humanity of all, you know? I, I, I keep wanting to say, you know, in conclusion, but I, <laughs> I keep wanting to con conclude, but, but I, I just, I, I can't press the point enough that we have are we are in an insane, you know, even before the, to me, it was the, like when the kids, when the when the asylum seekers' children were taken from them and thrown into dog kennels, you know, little three year olds in, in, in dog kennels and seven when, when it's toddlers in jail, as they're all over the United States, there are toddlers in the rock. We are in science fiction now. We are in dystopia. It's over. We are there. There are still children incarcerated, right? Three year olds in front of judges to right now. Okay. So that we don't, we, that everything else, we can get back to our own, we can get back to our individual incarnations um, uh, later, some other time. But now, you know, we, we need the major social transformation. Thank you for listening, <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Tongo. Whoa. Next up, Thea Matthews. Born and raised in San Francisco, California, Thea Matthews is a queer black feminist activist, poet, educator, and author. She earned her BA in sociology at UC Berkeley where she studied and taught June Jordan's program, Poetry for the People, directed by black feminist author, Aya de Leon, great writer. Currently, Thea is a public health researcher and an MFA candidate for creative writing at NYU. She is the poetry editor for, for Women Who Roar and her debut collection of poetry, Unearth the Flowers, released earlier this year. Please welcome Thea. Hi everyone, I'm Thea Matthews and I'm so grateful to be here among all of you. Um, wow, it's so beautiful to see so many faces tuned in to such a much needed event. Thank you, Maya, for organizing this. Um, and what a question, right? To like live with, to embody. Um, you know, it's interesting as I was listening to Tongo Yes and yes, but you know, it's, um, I have a lot of hope um, 
because I just, I think of what hegemony means, right? Hegemony of this like power enforced, right? That controls the masses by the ruling class. And yet that power of control, hegemony requires active participation. And so what occurs when we stop participating in our own oppression? What does that then look like? What do we have the opportunity to? Because no one can have access to your thoughts, your feelings, your mind. We can be highly infiltrated, influenced. But you have choice. And when you have choice, you have power. Right. And it does get compromised of what choice do you have, right? When we are in a hyper militarized state. And so the choice then is are you willing to fight or are you willing to lay? The poems that I'm about to deliver is from a new uh, collection, book project, if you were. It's an experiment uh, titled Americana. And I'm working with the Trimeric form. I don't know if there's any poets or writers up in here. Um, Trimeric is a 13 line. Uh, poem, it's a form, there's repetition, you'll hear. Um, in many of these poems I've been working and they're new, so God knows what's gonna happen, you know, in terms of revision, further revision and editing. Um, but I really felt compelled to share with you some of what I have been working on that really I feel embodies and answers this question. And what I've been doing, right, with the title Americana um, is that the American flag has been this central focal metaphor that has opened doors, right? It's the entryway in of looking behind of history and then looking ahead of where we could go, right? Um, in terms of revolt, in terms of reclaiming, in terms of acknowledging that we are on stolen land, acknowledging that what I think I have was never really mine to begin with. And in terms of how to decolonize my own thinking and to step away from this taking and judgment, right? Racism to me is a form of mental illness in many ways, right? Of this hatred and fear combined. And what would it take to dismantle fear? And I, that's why I think this like such events like this is so empowering because I don't believe in law. Like law cannot dismantle fear. Law cannot dismantle hate, but a poem can, a painting a dance, a song, you feel it because it's the universal language, right? And so no surprise, what's the first thing that gets cut in schools is art. And so many young folks, like including myself too, like having to just fight for your art. And like, you know, I know it's been already said, like it's kind of cliche that we're all born artists, but there is that creativity component. We are all creators in some way. Um, so I'll read these poems. And then I'll close. And I'm really grateful to be here and I look forward to hearing your questions. Do you know the length of fire? I do not know. Oh, most merciful mother, forgive. A scorching gullet implodes under the haze of a copper sun. One day, blades of cloth will no longer be blades severing spirits. Oh, most merciful mother, Forgive a scorching gullet, a revised constitution caught in the throat, a moment slice to admit wrong would move mountains. White implodes under the haze of a copper sun. One day, the sweet freedom song will be Lady Liberty carrying the kin, once slain, enslaved by the thrills. Blood, blades of cloth will no longer be blades severing spirits. The red heritage, the soil of this land, the land of pilgrim exile, the desperation to flee, occupy, kill. This next poem, I've taken lyrics from America the Beautiful. Oh, beautiful for heroes proved, white sheets of terror. Oh, what wander to kill Strings of spruce and cedar strum the harmonies of chalk, bodies murdered. America, sweet America, stars speckled blue uniforms. Oh, what wander to kill. Strings of spruce and cedar, old calloused fingers, 
oak trees forced to hold rope, dogs bark at the river. The suns, a God-given strike, strum the harmonies of chalk, bodies murdered, each heart an abandoned church. I stand heartless, the trigger pulled, fatal gunshot wound, black, this is America, sweet America, stars speckled blue uniforms, tarnished by shock, screams, promise me change, the rocking chair sways, drifts from sea to shining sea. Next one, cop words from Star Spangled Banner. They came for promise, claim this land, sanctuary. They came for the dreams, within dreams, within dreams. They called this land, land of the free and the home of the brave. Do not trust the pilgrim, a burning cross inside a fire. They came for the dreams, within dreams, within dreams, for a new world to stratify blood to fragment, souls to splinter, enslave people under the gleam of triumph. They call this land, land of the free and the home of the brave. All I see is torture, a legacy of torture, a cabinet of porcelain to walk through fear. Some kill, do not trust the pilgrim, a burning cross inside a fire you will find skin boiling. Fear is fatal, greed kills. But you already know this. Take the scissors. Cut, cut, cut out each star. Stare into each incision of a state revoked, a district of settlement beneath the rocks, the damned have been boxed into a slow suicide. I, a vigilante, remember the times, an incision of a state revoked, a district of settlement from bondage to boundlessness. Liberty is liberty, not a euphemism for enslavement of the body beneath the rocks. The damned have been boxed into packaged meat, the commercialized politicians clamor for attention, validation, be the breast milk for a slow suicide. I, a vigilante, remember the times, an opening of the eye. What does it mean to have an abolished state, a nation reconfigured? I cut straight. Together, we stare at a barren tree by land seemingly untouched. The thing about molestation is that often one cannot see the internal bruising of a violation done. The skin smooth, a calm river calms us, remains untouched. The thing about molestation is that often death is like death. A barren tree is like a barren tree. A summer's twilight precipitates veins of coral billows. One cannot see the internal bruising of a violation done. Rape is like rape. An eagle soars across the sky. Its wings flap above the slanted pole. A sign to be brave, to feel the skin smooth. A calm river calms us remains the beloved of stars and stripes with the flames blazing from gut to mouth. God be with us as we rise. I am home, I am home. I am a home and a country, a box within a box. My body a blue corner, a mass between breath and bullet. Death is the light you revel in, the awe, wander, should leave us no more. A battle, a box within a box, my body a blue corner, a mass of bodies unspoken, seep into the pigments of paint, stroked along borders, 
every sequential line rests between breath and bullet. Death is the light you revel in like the sparkle of murder, an, act, an octave high sung by a swallow on the seams of triumph in the awe. Wonder shall leave us no more, a battle won on rescue land. No, this is the land of conquest, the land of my blood, forced and native, captured. Dead bodies, the weight of cloth, oscillate in the wind. You can feel a one-time pulse permeate through veins. Not everyone bows down, not everyone in chains. This country, a corpse, a fixed smile of malicious joy. You can feel a one-time pulse permeate through veins. The blood of defeat, one beat. The blood of conquest, another beat. Barbarism strips the land, descends. Not everyone bows down, not everyone in chains. Hundreds of slave rebellions, thousands of protests, a determination to strike back. My people know this country, a corpse, a fixed smile of malicious joy, festers and acquittals, blue eyes, master, brutality from white sheets, plain clothes to uniforms, stop them. And then you'll see the famous Patrick Henry's line, <laughs> revenge, a slice of pumpkin pie. No, make it pecan. Shattered porcelain, the master uses the fabric to whip the backs of slave labor. Give me liberty or give me death. I have an insatiable sweet tooth. I will live, fight on, shattered porcelain, the master uses the fabric to whip the backs, shouting liberty, liberty, liberty. From this atrocity, I will make a den out of bones. Release the backs of slave labor. Give me liberty or give me death and crackle, and crackle wood of shadows. I will pull each limb, each body, a rebel, a vigilante, a freedom fighter. I have an insatiable sweet tooth. I will live fight on, gaze into eyes of silver. My body is yours, skin to skin, our screams unbearable. We raise a hatchet in hand. And then I have two more. This one is after Asada Shakur. Ah, and what's today? Anyway, um, this is for Asada and I, um, I take, um, I've incorporated her chant. And if you don't know it, may you pray with it and know it by heart. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love each other and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. It is our duty to win. Let the song in. Let the chant be your blood, be blood of a blue never before seen of the truest red. We must love each other and support each other. Sobering heart of an eagle, altruistic plane of a melody, the spectrum of melanin. My God, she is black. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Shackles, the free market. Shackles, the police state. Shackles, alcoholism. Shackles, we break. And then you know where this comes from. And I'm closing with this. Free at last, free at last. Thank God almighty, we are free at last. No more Michaels, Eric's, Sandra's, George's. No more Brianna's, Trayvon's, Tamir's. We must defund, disarm, dismantle. Defund, disarm, dismantle. No more Michael's, Eric's, Sandra's, George's. No more, I say, to murder, prisons, rape, 
to fight, I remember childhood rape, all violence, torture, no more. Brianna's, Trayvon's, Tamir's. We must be armed by love, by spirit, by the ghosts of everyone waiting, stuck here until we amend the bullet. Declare, defund, disarm, dismantle, defund, disarm, dismantle. Langston referred to justice as a blind goddess, yet she's free at last, free at last. Thank God almighty, we are free at last. You can envision, you can hope, you can create, and then back it up, right? Um, it's kind of along the lines of like picking your battles. The beautiful thing too with art is that you can create new worlds, right? There's dystopia and then I wouldn't necessarily call this utopia and I kind of like, you know, it's more so like utopia in a sense of revolution maybe. I don't know if you caught that. Um, dismantle of the state. But is it so far out of reach? Can you imagine it? And if you can imagine it, that's the greatest power, honestly, of the human mind. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Thea. All right. Next is Asal. Asal, in a way, is a professor and the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, Equity, and Inclusion in the College of Integrative Sciences and Arts at Arizona State University. His research focuses on anti-racist and social justice theory and practices in writing assessments. His book, Anti-Racist Writing Assessment Ecologies, Teaching and Assessing for a Socially Just Future, won the 2015 CWPA Outstanding Book Award. He has also published a co-edited collection, Writing Assessment, Social Justice and the Advancement of Opportunity, and a book, Labor-Based Grading Contracts, Building Equity and Inclusion in the Compassionate Writing Classroom. Please welcome us, Sal. All right. You can hear me all okay? Excellent. Um, I have two, uh, two things prepared to read. The first is um, kind of a statement, uh, and the second is a poem which I feel now a little self-conscious about reading since I'm not really a poet. Um, I am a, a rhetorician and a scholar and such, and these wonderful poets before me uh, are way more, uh, um, uh, are, are probably not, I should not follow them, but I am going to have to. So here it is. What is anti-racist writing? My response to a question like this is tangled up in my identity as a teacher of color who has grown up and worked in white supremacist educational systems and society. What's anti-racist writing? I don't know if I'd ask the question in this manner. I mean, asking it this way sounds like we're talking about craft or that the anti-racist work I do in language is somehow inherently anti-racist in its DNA. Like no matter what I say, because I'm saying it in an anti-racist way, I'm saying anti-racist things. I'm doing anti-racism. Hmm. That sounds like a hegemonic trick. I ain't about to be tricked. Well, I doubt that's the spirit of this question. I cannot help but think this. Again, I'm having a hard time with the question because, well, I wouldn't ask it like that. I'd ask about something like, how do you do anti-racist writing? Or what does anti-racist writing mean in the world, in action, and among people? I don't wanna say that such a question is inappropriate or the wrong one to ask either. Maybe I've just not thought of my anti-racist writing habits as a what is kind of thing. It is really more of a doing, practicing every day, writing every day, languaging particular anti-structural ideas in anti-structural ways, reading every day with a humble orientation to those who beg my ear and eye. I ain't kidding about the chronic writing neither. I'm a languageling. I can't help it. My day isn't full unless I've done writing, and usually it's the first thing in the morning. 
is that anti-racist in an educational system that demands that I do lots of other administrative stuff when the writing and research I'm doing talks against that shit? Is daily writing enough to be anti-racist? Can you be anti-racist when you hardly ain't got any anti-racist outcomes to show people? Can we language in ways that ain't that anti the racist systems around us without getting co-opted to some greater degree? Is that at the heart of this question? Is it paradox? Because racism in our society and schools today is interlocked with white supremacy. For me, anti-racism is part of anti-white supremacy work. For me, the guy who does research on language and his judgment in classrooms, anti-racist writing is a practice done to confront and dismantle white language supremacy. It's a practice that requires me to yank back the heavy cloak of the habits of white language we all inherit from our society and schools that historically come from, the, from a middle to upper class white racial group of people who have controlled education, schools, and academic disciplines. These elite white men mostly wrote the gram grammar books and style guides. They referee the journals and edit the magazines. They make decisions about clarity and concision according to their tastes in news broadcasts and TV shows. And even when they are BIPOC, if we want the job, we conform mostly until we get enough power to resist. But too often it's too late. We have been assimilated, borgified, too much skin in the game now, so much so that my brown language skin is also white. Resistance is futile. So how do we write in anti-racist fashion against such ubiquitous white language supremacy, against such internal linguistic colonization? I wonder. I know I cannot do it very easily. I fell in love with and married white language supremacy by first seeing the dominant white English languaging as good and smart and rejecting my first English, a poor black English, even though I am Japanese and white and likely Greek and Italian, but I'm talking about the politics and racialized positioning of languaging in English, not my ethnic and cultural background. I was just an eight-year-old remedial English student in North Las Vegas, an almost all black area when it started. I then courted that English in college and became an English major after denying it for a few years, changing majors three or four times. Then I became an English language writing teacher in graduate school and a scholar of it too. I married it, had babies, books and articles, little languagelings that went out into the world and did things. We, the dominant white English language and I are inseparable. Now, what the fuck am I to do? Get a divorce? Give away half or more of me so that I can be another languaging that I've never been, at least not as an adult. And yet, I ain't all white English in my bones, in my mouth. And it's taken me many years to remember how them words felt in my mouth. Some gone, some not so. And some slightly, still lightly linger in my saliva. Today, my anti-racist writing is kind of uh, like a lumberjack who has broken some of his saws and tools over his own knee, but he mostly only knows how to use those tools in the way they've been given to him by the establishment. Can you imagine this? A fucking lumberjack who tries hard every day not to cut trees down, still a buzzing chainsaw in his hand, rattling away, begging him, cut that tree. It'll feel good. You'll get rewarded. It's worth a lot, man. But this crazy lumberjack wants to plant stuff instead, nurturing green things with rough, calloused hands. I know, the conceit is too binary, maybe. There's something to be said about lumber and the jacks that provide it for our language homes. Can we all live in forests? There's also something in that gardener, arborist, lumberjack who sees life, not lumber, in a tree or forest. My languaging, though, is probably more cultivated land, carefully crafted gardens rather than rough and, and wild forests. I'm probably getting too figurative now, but that's language, right? Maybe examples will help. What is anti-racist writing? 
Right now, for me, it's Ibram X. Kendi, Gloria Andaldua, uh, Patricia Collins, Eduardo Benia Silva, Victor Villanueva, my mentor, Geneva Smetherman, Derek Bell, Claudia Rankin, Ronald Takaki, VJ Prashad, Nadia Korfor, Daryl Wing Sue, Richard Delgado, and Jean Stefanich, Stuart Hall, Nell Urban Painter, Edward Said, Angela Davis, George Lipsitz, Rosina Lippi Green, David Rodiger, Audrey Lord and Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz. I'm not listing everyone, of course. I'm listing those who influence me. And as I look at my list in total, it isn't balanced. I mean, it's not overly lopsided from one angle. The list that is from the top of my head has 10 women of color out of 23, but I have no trans, only one indigenous scholar. How much of this is a product of my own habits and inability to look harder at my field or as an anti-racist reader, how much of this is a product of what the system gives me as options, the color that the white academic publishing system allows me to choose from? So what does it mean to do anti-racist writing in such white language supremacist conditions? And again, I know this ain't the question exactly at hand. It's the question I can answer, or can I? Maybe one answer is that it means you gotta be restless or gotta be resting, re, re, you gotta wrestle more with the systems that made you. You gotta look at them all the time with one eyebrow raised, cocking your head back. Maybe you gotta be writing with a pair of pliers and a broken snaggle tooth saw, pulling apart the things that made you, ripping and tearing at shit, leaving uneven and jagged seams and cut marks in the words that you rubbed into your skin like suntan lotion. Did they really protect you from the sun? Who said your mouth, your languaging needed protecting anyway, I wonder? Protecting from what? These questions feel like anti-racist writing to me. Maybe you got to have an irreverent and humbly disrespectful way about yourself. That is, you got to be compassionate to people, not institutions or histories. Maybe anti-racist writing is always a restless, irreverent, and violent question that we just have to keep asking and answering. And then now, uh, my last thing is the, this poem. Since, uh, since both Tongo and Thea um, uh, mentioned hegemony or talked about it in some forms, uh, I thought I'd read this poem uh, since it, 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 it's, it's, it's about hegemony and about what I do. Hegemony is a house built on personal contradictions. It means that the critically conscious are critically guilty and seemingly hypocritical. It means limits and boundaries that feel like free will, but are really predetermined preferences that feel like ourselves and feel good in our bones. It all works better when the system doesn't have to point a gun or order people to do or, or think things. It's, it lets people point guns at themselves do and think things it wants them to do and think. Hegemony convinces people that their oppression isn't oppression at all. It's Sunday afternoon football games and going out to each to eat after church or watching the latest action film or playing an innocent video game made of killing and collecting electronic representations of real life people and things that aren't real but feel like it. It's conspicuously choosing the choices given to you. Hegemony is a system that makes you feel bad and inadequate for what it doesn't provide. It's like blaming the tennis player for where the baseline is located or that you only get two chances at serving each point. Only the hegemonic sets up its rules in order to benefit those who make rules. In such places, a few make rules and systems to perpetuate the things, conditions, and world they want to keep and pass on to their kids. This is all called fairness, merit, hard work, and always receding delayed gratification, or should we say deleted gratification. Gratification never meant to be realized, only dangled in front of so many, a rhetorical Ponzi scheme played by those who only give the oppressed words and try to convince them that they are not oppressed, but free, free to be poor, free to do whatever they want. There is much oppression in the freedom that only words make. These are our values that devalue. 
putting aside the abstraction of the middle class, what I think is left in the world, the real material world, is our languages, our stories, and the common senses we tell ourselves. But be careful, everything is paradoxical when you drill down. A word is hegemony made personal. And our stories help us consent to an unfair and racist world by offering us teachers and intellectuals a slice of really nice pie. Sure, the pie can do things and it's awfully, terribly beautiful. But language is paradoxical. How is access to the middle class, whether abstract or real, not also becoming an agent of white supremacy becoming the beautiful agent of racist systems made syrupy sweet. Are we not merely offering future opportunities and success in inopportune and anti-successful systems in our classrooms? Hegemony is a house built on personal contradictions. It's the sweet taste of almost there. Once we've bitten into the delicious and comforting pie, we can't help but eat it all gobbling it down and asking for more from the system and those who made it. But how exactly are the systems made that make our hunger for more pieces of pie? And in our classrooms, we try to help our students, especially those coming from places and groups who have not had a taste of the pie yet, get their tastes. But it's all just the same old pie. And the result, rotten teeth and diabetes. And it's all our fault and their fault and the system's fault. And it's all we can do, even as we resist. You gotta live, right? You gotta pay the bills and be happy, right? Hegemony is a story built on personal contradictions. It's metonymy and synecdoche. It's white supremacy made in us all. Thanks. Thank you, Sal. All right, our final presenter, um, before we have um, some Q&A and some of those questions are already coming in. Um, so that's encouraging. Ty Freedom Ford is a New York City high school English teacher and Kaveh Kahnem fellow. Her poetry, fiction, and essays have appeared in dozens of magazines and anthologies. She was a 2015 Center for Fiction fellow and the Poetry Project's 2016 Emerge Surface B Poetry Fellow. Most recently, she has won awards from the community of literary magazines and presses and is a 2019 Jerome Hill Artist Fellowship inaugural fellow. Winner of the 2015 to the Lighthouse Poetry Prize, her first poetry collection, How to Get Over, is available from Red Hand Press. Her second poetry collection, one of the best in the past year and more black, is the winner of the 2020 Lambda Literary Award for Poetry. Please welcome Ty. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, thank you, uh, Asal. Thank you, Thea. Thank you, Tongo, for setting us off on a real, real. Um, so yeah, um, I, I feel similarly to Asal in that, like, I was, I was, um, I guess, a little puzzled by the question. I, 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 I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I was like, I. I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to this question. I believe I even said that to Maya too. I was like, uh, I don't, I, you know, when he, he asked me to be on a panel, I was like, I don't know if I exactly have the answers for that, but yes. Um, and yeah. And so, because I, I mean, I think, because I, I, I think what I struggle with is who, to whom am I responding and like, uh, or like, you know, and I'm like, and do I, should I, is that my responsibility, right? To like define, to, def to define that for, for these folks. Um, and so, you know what I mean? Like, I'm, I was just like, you know, so anyway, I just like scribble some shit together of, of what I really think anti-racist anti writing is. And, and I think it is a call, it is a response. It is a calling forth and a calling out into the light. It highlights and it lights the way. It is also shade and no shade, shady and shadow work. It subverts, converts, connects, 
and checks. It is performative and proud and pride and ride or die. It starts as ally, becomes accomplice. It accomplishes, activates, centers, decenters, disobeys, disturbs, disrupts, interrupts, erupts. It calls us forward, calls out cowards, calls, calls, calls until there is an answer, but it is always a call. All right. And so thinking about answers, I'm going to read this, this, this poem. Um, I'm going to read five poems for you guys, but I'm going to read this poem called Answers. They ask what I believe in, sour milk, the curdle and butter of it, baby's breath ragged with phlegm, the green sheen clinging to her skin like algae, the bone and teeth of us mossy and alive with DNA. But what's your religion thereafter? What gods do you pray to? The frilly curtains of her laughter remodeling all of my pain. Oh, how she adorns this house of mine. So God's a woman, hands on their hips. How water ain't a woman, the way she make you thirst her temperamental breasts and everywhere, everything, everyone, every which way, water. Well, who your altars honor? The ghosts that inhabit us and all the evidence of them, double vision, floaters flecking our periphery when we look away from the light, all the mouths at the bottom of our stomach. Ever wonder why we eat two plates and still hungry? Or how our anger multiplies in seconds like a kitchen of Negro roaches? Yes, even the roaches have melanin, black, brown with the spirits of wayward witches. I burn candles and pour brown liquor out for my bitches and their glorious golden auras. To what churches do you tithe? Our lady of ladled magnificence, God of ghetto grace incorporated. Our mother who art in Harlem, house of regurgitated resurrections. Have you ever been possessed? We ain't never not been owned. Not with all that restless bone sediment at the bottom of the Atlantic. Wonder why we frantic with personalities. How we sing with three throats, bending notes, weeping willow. What are trees if not spirits weeping and dancing simultaneous? How we dipped our nooses in gold and hung crosses from them and wore them like shiny portable altars. How is there not a church in our chests? How our breasts leak gospel truth? How our teeth ache with the blood of Jesus? Who then is your muse? Pointing. Ain't she a muse, amusing, amaze, amazing, Amazon of our dreams, prisms that fracture into auras and auras that fragment dimensions. Isn't mourning a religion then? Like how all these feelings grow muscles and flex and jerk inside of me. Like how they can't kill us even when they hand scream bloody murder. Like how we show up wearing white just to spite them. Spit at the pulpit of bullshit and Babylon. How we eat Bibles for breakfast, Leviticus and grits. Our souls sizzling in the skillet like gizzards. What is the geography of your grief? everywhere they are and ain't, painting the block milk white and sickly, a tricky bluish tint, think veins under skin, a sticky blues, a blush, blood, bluing the block, black. So I'm gonna read you four poems from the book. Um, 
the book is mostly it's 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 all sonnets, um, so they'll be short. Um, and I, the first three are really me thinking about um, movement. Um, so this this first one was written on a cruise ship. How do I live today, every day? By forgetting that I am going to die. But there is this massive city of a ship in the middle of an ocean of invisible ink, the water that won't turn cold, the teeth brushing, the bacteria percolating at the gum line, the baseline of this song in my head, this waistline oozing outward, these inward thoughts rattling, battling for a seat on the subway at the table, this able body, unwilling, lackadaisical, only my heart in a rush, racing towards some nowhere and sudden days in between. These are all the reminder I need without your exaggerated fears, your easy bullets. Uh, so this poem I wrote on a plane um, and at the time, because I feel like now you can like text on a plane because there's like Wi-Fi and shit, but this was like before you could do that. Like, and so I used to always think like the plane was just gonna go down in flames if somebody was like texting after they told you to cut your phone off. All right, so to the white man next to me, texting the entire flight. Ain't that the point to always be the exception without being exceptional? to smoke the joint but not inhale, to pale in comparison, to redden but not bleed, to flail but not get shot, to drive, to walk, to talk out the side of your mouth, to be in the South and be safe, to pick up your child, to pull out your license, to smoke a cigarette in your car, to go to a pool party, to swim in a pool of your choice that is not your own blood, to voice your irritation, to play, me to play your music loud, to be loud, to remain silent, to need help, to give help, to have the whole damn plane at the mercy of your fingertips. This poem I wrote, sort of in my head, parts of it while driving. Uh, I was driving back from Atlanta to New York. It's called Roadkill. Oh dear, I am sorry for your roadside funeral, speeding procession of shock and pity. We wonder how a deer dies, suicide? And what of the fender that did you in? Eyeless bastard with no regard for nature. This your backyard. Black boys sympathetic though. Know what it like to lie in a road for hours. The sun making fun of your composure. Oh dear, how you decompose. Bloodless body, party of rigor mortis. Only your head disintegrates into a mulch of leaves. Black boys not as graceful. Their clumsy blood shimmers and shames the pavement. Oh dear, dear, at least your death accident. Though some will say you had it coming. And then I'll end with this poem that I feel like a sow was, was was hitting my word. This is my favorite word, but a sow kept hitting that ain't. And, uh, and that's the name of this poem. It's called ain't, because it's literally like legit, like one of my favorite words. All right. Ain't. Suddenly these poems bore me. These sentences, this syntax, these line fragments wagging their fingers at me, this Ironic Ebonics, this King's English, bastard cockney bores me. These knock-kneed line breaks, this rhyme, internal, 
identical, metrical, Shakespearean, especially boring, whoring some eternal infamy bores me. Surely this diction, these dictionaries we call brains, call tongues, call mother, these similes ain't bulletproof. Niggas still dead as dead niggas, still black niggas as black as black is. This bores me, snores me to sleep, but sleep is not dead. Amen. I wake up, but this woke bores me. This writing, this documenting, this archiving, this truth telling, this shaming the devil, this publishing exclusive or nah ain't a cloak, ain't a savior, Jesus or otherwise, ain't a time machine threatening reverse, ain't a nurse, ain't a witch, ain't no magical stitch to hem up all them wounds, boring, every TV's black face laughing at me bores me, this prosody, this scansion, these lyrical miracles glowed up on the page, ain't a suicide bomb ain't blowed up nothing corporate, ain't fed nobody hungry, ain't nothing but a happy meal trap anthem for the white boy sing along. They mouths all neon coil, these rhythms all African, these stanzas all white and gaping, this shiny MFA thesis, this poet laureate lux, this Pulitzer bling, this push cart hustle, this black tie book award ain't nothing but a funeral. A hymn, a dirge, a eulogy, an apology, an afterthought so boring I could cry, could fuck, could boogie, could whiskey, could die right fucking here, could die, could die, could die, could die, could die, could die, bored as fuck and waiting for these promising poems, these impressive missives, these polished sonnets to save me, to give me my entire life, to be bread and wine, loaves and fishes, manna and nectar, but they ain't, 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 ain't a sledgehammer, ain't a deliverance, ain't a resurrection, a rewind button, a second thought, a benefit of the doubt, ain't, ain't, ain't shit, but words shine to a sequin shimmy. Now give me my fucking fellowship, my POC retreat, my space amongst the trees, my university position, my cup runneth over, ain't nothing to see here. Thank you. Thank you, Ty. And just once again, thank you, Thea. Thank you, Tongo. Thank you, Ty. Thank you, Asal. That gives tons of, of thinking to be had. Um, so our Q&A portion is going to be <clears throat> relatively short because we know that people have butts and people sitting in chairs in Zoom. It makes it difficult. And so we want to respect that. But we already have a, a deluge of questions. Um, and so I'm gonna um, start with some, but if anyone, if anyone else wants to throw some into the chat, you're welcome to, and, and I'll gladly um, distribute it back. I'm just gonna unmute all of our folks so that they can, they can speak openly and candidly. Feels weird to give them permission to speak. <laughs> it's kind of effed. Okay. So, um, if y'all don't mind, I wanted to start with something practical that one of the students asked. Um, what are some common unintentional racial bias mistakes to be aware of and avoid in writing? Cultural appropriation and also. I mean, gosh, there's a slew of names that I just kind of like shove out of memory. But I guess in terms of racial bias, I don't know if this really answers the question, but what immediately came to mind was um, writers, and this can get kind of controversial, um, 
writers from a like who are non-black writing from a black perspective. You know, um, it's like a Faulkner. I don't know. That's like a love and hate type of person, you know. Um, I'm sure there's others, but I think that's one, and I'm sure there's many, but yeah, I'll stop there. Would anyone else like to tackle that one? I don't know if this is, um, uh, if this gets at the spirit of that question, but um, when I think about uh, unintentional, well, what they're calling unintentional racial bias mistakes in writing to be aware of. I, th I think about the, um, the way in which um, too many uh, writers who, um, and this is scholars and others who take their own position as a universalized one, and it usually is a white, uh, hegemonic white dominant one, middle-class one. Um, and think that that perspective is, is always accessible and of equal proximity to anyone, anyone who might be reading them. Um, so they're, so it's not a, so in one sense, I want to say it's not a, it's not a humble approach uh, up to your reader. It's instead a very different one that says, look, I know I've got this answer. It may, it may be mine, but it can be universal. And you, I'm sharing it with you because that's the, the, the because I, I'm the one with the, with the words and I'm giving it to you. So feel like that's um that can be part of it it just uh, but again context and what's happening uh in that writing is always important um and part of me wants to say you know, a, a different response it's a very separate one I me mean, wants to say um one uh one mistake is to think that you aren't going to make those um they're going to be made uh and so the real question is how do we take responsibility for that when it happens and not deny pretend push away or what, or, or what have you, or blame other people or blame other things. Anyone else would like to answer that one? I would, I would just add that really by the time you pick up the pen, it's too late. You know? <laughs> it, it's really about the work you put in before you pick up the pen and what have you, what have you been learning? What have you been practicing? That's coming down there with you to that page, regardless of what little protocols you have in place or what things you try to keep in mind or what mantras you got taped up around your crib. <laughs> so you got to, you know, have to just put in that work before you, before you, um, before you dance your mind on the page, you know? But that's the great news though, because you can do all, you know, we, it's, that's, 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 just crack the book, you know, go <laughs> crack the book, go to the meeting, make the sign, you know what I mean? I think, sorry. <laughs> go, go to therapy. You know? <laughs> there's like one thing I could briefly like say to just elaborate, because writing is quite general. So I'm assuming this is like for prose and poetry or is this scholarly writing or just writing in general? Um, I guess I'll just speak from like the standpoint of creative writing, just there's been a long like stance like in terms of history and storytelling, right? And so like something to be aware of is whose story are you trying to tell? Because no matter what research you do, you're not fill in the blank. And so how do you honor and respect and like recognize your position in relation to what you're interested in, right? Because so many non, like so much of white supremacy, or I don't know, like the antithesis of anti -ra like racist writing is to keep us as subjects, blacks, like just POC, BIPOC folks, right? And so like if a white person's asking this question and I don't know, they wanna like have like an Asian character or they wanna write from like a standpoint of a black woman. And I don't know if this is like, too tangent, uh, tangent, you know, um, but that's something to be mindful of, of like whose story and are you perpetuating stereotypes? Check yourself. I mean, I know Tongo says like if I have time <laughs> pen to paper, it's late, right? But this is stuff to be mindful of. Of um, Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> right, avoid it. You know, but that, that's the question, yeah. It's like stereotypes and storytelling and um, how to not perpetuate erasure.
All right. Um, to piggyback on that, um, there's a question that just came in that I think uh, relates more closely, and then I'll close with um, a third question that um, someone is really insistent on asking. Um, the second question is, um, we're a predominantly white institution, um, Santa Clara. What advice do you have for our BIPOC students for surviving in white spaces and negotiating feelings of alienation and belonging? Sounds like we need to have another event with them here. Mm -hmm. Save, very short. <laughs> right, out of here. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I mean, I, I was thinking about that in the, in the other in the, the other question I was thinking about just my, my experience in, in MFA programs and in workshop with you know, as a fiction writer, and and um, and the assumptions that uh, folks made about me as a writer, about about me as a reader, and what I had read, and what had what I had not what hadn't I read, and was was making all kinds of comments about what I needed to read, and had no idea what I had read, and I was and I was just thinking about like, so I I mean I I, I feel like for for folks of color at those sorts of at predominantly white institutions, I feel like, um, I, I mean, I, if you're in a workshop model, I definitely feel like it is about, you know, finding one or two folks that you trust um, who, you know, cause I feel like not everybody's gonna get your shit regardless, even if it's a, if it's a room full of folks of color, like folks are still not gonna get your stuff sometimes. Um, but I, I found that going through that process that there were like two, two folks who consistently like told me stuff that I needed to hear and I like appreciated it. Um, but I, having been at a predominantly white institution, I, I feel like it is about making, uh, you know, try to find those safe spaces. Uh, uh, I went to, you know, Emory in the early nineties on a tail end of a, a racial incident that had happened with the student there. And all of my, my friends in high school was like, what you going to where, why? You know, and um, and I found that just it was a very tight knit uh, uh, community of folks of color. Like we just we sought each other out. We watched, you know, TV shows in our dorm rooms together. You know what I mean? But I mean, we we found a way to sort of like um, celebrate ourselves and and create a safe space for ourselves um, within that institution. And even today, like you know, thirty years later, that institution still has all kinds of like you know, issues around race. And to me, it, it's it's sad. And so uh, hang in there, stay black. That's what I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> stay black, stay black, or, you know, or brown or, you know, whatever you claim. You know, I um, every institution that I've, that I've either uh, was a student at or took a position at, I am, um, uh, and I didn't even know I was doing this until halfway through like that is like 15, 20 years in, I always sought out somebody, at least one person, somebody of my tribe, if, if you will, um, or a co-conspirator or somebody who I could, whom I could trust very much with like, I think what like was Ty was saying, um, except this, I was just looking for one person because they were all, because most of those places were predominantly white. Um, and so I, uh, so when, and I, when I found that person I, and I, I had a sort of a way to test and find out if I trust this person, um, but uh, that's what I did. And then I, I used them in the sense that we met usually like every week uh, just to decompress and, and talk about what happened uh, that week um, when I needed it. Um, and it was you, and in some places it was a lot more than other, in other places. Uh, so, so that's, so I think, I know that's a version of what, what Ty said, but, I'm, uh, but uh, for me, it was always about, I, all, what I needed was at least one person who I knew I could count on if I had trouble or if I was just feeling down, or if I was feeling beat down, I can go to them and just decompress. Yeah. I mean, City College had like less than 12%. I went to UC Berkeley, had less than 5%. Like I would be in full blown auditoriums pre pandemic era. And like a few years back, like 
auditoriums, like classrooms that held over 200 students. And I could like count them like the black people on one hand. I mean, I would be able to like walk for a good part, like good section of campus and just still rely on only one hand to see people that look remotely like me. And um, cause I kind of, if you are here sprinkled in this mix, cause I don't know if this is a question by someone white trying to be an ally to like help, I don't know, fellow black and POC, like POC folks, or if this is actually from someone who's POC saying, hey, this is this, this is the environment. <laughs> How to like, what's survive 101 look like? And for me, um, I felt, in, like, how do I say? I've been, in, I was inspired. I don't know, it's kind of one of those things where you create your own space, right? So like, whether that was like Black Student Union or like just some type of subspecialty group or some type of space where there's community that can grow and build and be cultivated, whether there's like one, like events off of this where that really like preserve the space, right? The safety um, and honestly the intention. Um, and putting a call out of like, I'm not the only one, you know, like there's a few of us. Can we like get together? Can we meet? Can there be like a weekly meetup? Um, at NYU right now, thankfully it's different. Like there's, it's quite diverse, um, at least from my experience. I mean, like I've only had two classes so far, but you know, still there's like community and it's harder now because now we're in a, pandemic era. So how do you build community when I'm literally relying on a fucking chat box and a screen? You know, I'm there with you. It's but you know, it can be done to build connection. It's harder. May, may, man, may we be the last generation that even has to have this fucking question. You know what I mean? Like the, the I mean, the the complete institutional reality of the United States is just to maintain this white ruling class and their stranglehold on, 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 on the productive life, on the cultural life, on the military life, on the educational life, on the social life uh, of this society. And it's through these ruin, it's through these institutions that they reproduce really their validity right that oh now you're doing something if you do it here right now now you now you're a poet if you put if you published in this thing or you got this kind of degree or somebody you know basically somebody white or somebody funded by white people stamps you now you're now now you have something to write home about mm -hmm. I, I think the interesting news though is that you know this, this will kind of this institutional reality is tied to the greater, um, you know, the greater dance between oppressor and oppressed. I'll say, you know, I got a little bit lucky because I'm like the tail end of a generation that's really told like what you do is for your people. So I was told to go bring something back, you know? Um, and, and, and so lucky and I see these times are more individualistic, like, everybody pretty much thinks they're on their own little personal adventure. And, you know, you roll with the punches or whatever, you know, whatever you perceive the hole you're in, but, you know, you still can't, you, you're just doing this kind of like uh, by yourself. Um, but that's, 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 that, that, that that's out. It, what, what you want to do is you, uh, uh, oh, you groovy, <laughs> what do they call them now? Five pot? What is it? <laughs> what the young folks say? They you want to all these groovy black pop. And otherwise, you got to get with a different hole. See, the problem is you define, if you define yourself, we define ourselves by the holes, not hold in, but the entireties that you think you're a part of. That's how you define yourself. And that's what guides you. Know, and it also very much affects your emotional state. <laughs> So what you want to do is you want to tap in with different with with with, with different entireties, like a a, a a a a a revolutionary movement, you know. And this isn't unprecedented. You know, a lot of the the, the, the a lot of the great revolutionaries from the sixties that was all 
college kids, you know. A lot of the great revolutionaries of hardcore decolonization wars that one that kicked white countries out of their they country, they were college kids as well. The 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 um what the college kid has. Or, or 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 those who live a kind of life of the mind, you have a historical choice, always. Y'all either be some of the most effective revolutionaries or y'all be real good servants of, the, uh, uh, of this ruling class, you know, good cogs in the wheel. That's, that's basically the way to go. So you got to, well, what you got to make a decision on what, what are you a part of? What are you actually part? Because guess what? You're part of something whether you like it or not. But now you have to now you make make a clear decision, you know? And that, and and it, it don't have to be all like and you know, and that don't mean like and this has this advice has a softer side to that, but then maybe, you know, other community that you, you know, like when I was in New York going down to the New Regan Poets Cafe, that was a big that that was a nice orientation for me to have as a youngster, you know. It was a nice way to define myself. So you can always sidestep these kind of institutions, but just find kind of people institutions that organically exist to, to link up with too, to get something, again, to define yourself by. But ultimately, good people, it, it, this thing is either going, we're either going to have major social transformation or it, or it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> I want to. I want to. I want to. I want to second what Tungler just said, but uh, say it. Just say one. One thing that's different, um, and about uh, when you're younger, you are freer than you will ever be. Right now, tomorrow you will be less free, and I mean that the whatever we're talking about, whether we're talking about school, family, religion, career, whatever, they're little hooks, and they're they. Get, the older you get more hooks you get hooked in you and it's harder to unhook um and you will be this is why the military for instance they like they uh well, they don't want um uh soldiers who are older than 25 or 30. actually it's uh 39 i think is like the oldest that they'll take and without special disposition the reason for that is that they know by the time you get a certain age you got a family you got attachments hooks you are less likely to do what you are told like kill somebody for no damn reason. So I say, uh, Tom is absolutely right. I mean, much of the revolutions, you know, the, the, the real, uh, the engines of them come from young people in college and so forth. Um, because at that time you are, you are, your minds are the freest. You have the least encumbrances, economic and otherwise. What, how liberating is it to not have any, any of the encumbrances that, that one has like a mortgage or worrying about children that you have or family you have to take care of or yeah. a job that you're going to cultivate. You, you, still have all, you still have all the cartilage in your knee. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> right. Your back still works, right? <laughs> We're not really, I, I'm just hearing ageism. Yeah. With much love and respect, I'm hearing ageism. I mean, I don't think it's actually healthy to like make assumptions on people's lives. Because people can have be like bird, I, I don't know, in terms of the weight of life and what one carries at a young age, regardless of age, regardless of age, and that we all have a part. All so right. I want to make that very clear. I don't want to have this become an ageist conversation on who can do what for the movement. I stand by the cartilage thing. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I hear you for sure. <laughs> You're a fucking cartilagist. <laughs> uh, man, I'm mad at the world, man. <laughs> What's in that bottle, Tonga? <laughs> uh, man, just water. <laughs> Agua, you know. Can I also just say to my to my folks of color too? Is you know, I, I on second thought, I'm also saying, you know, uh, you know. Be seen, be heard, take up space, um, make motherfuckers move out your way, um, and 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 acknowledge you and and see how beautiful you are and 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 let them get to know you and and you know and 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 because why you know I feel like we even should we shouldn't even be preoccupied with trying to figure out what we should do to take care of self in these institutions. They should be trying to figure out what to do to take care of us 
and make us feel more comfortable in these environments, right? And so why are we bending over backwards, you know, trying to figure out how to fuck, fucking, you know, survive? I think that was the word uh, in in these situ, in, you know, in this in this institution, in these situations. Take up space, be free, do you, and let motherfuckers conform to who the hell you are, right? Just be beautiful, be brown, be black, be you know, be loud, be proud, be be ignorant, be ghetto. Don't be like trying to make yourself small and dull, right? Be shiny, you know, be extra and, and don't feel like you need to like, um, you know, cater to somebody else's thoughts about who the hell you are and where you come from, right? Be all of that and and be, you know, like like as I was talking about as far as language and shit, don't, don't try to clean up your language and, and, and cater and conform to folks, you know what I'm saying? Like be, be authentic about who you are um, and, and, and give yourself breathing room in those environments and let and let people you know respect um, all that you bring to the table and, and including all of your ancestors right so yeah thanks you all um, <clears throat> we'll we'll end with this question and it kind of is in the spirit of where you all went with that one anyway um, I'll put it in the chat as well the final question of the evening is anti-racism inherently an anti-capitalist practice? Yes. <laughs> I knew you were gonna be the, I knew you were gonna hop on that. <laughs> yeah, good, good job on that question, whoever. I'm gonna ask that question of himself. He asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> you fed that to somebody time. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I said that, you know, absolutely, <laughs> man, you know, yeah, case closed. Yeah, honestly, I mean, it's a pretty short, succinct answer. I mean, you think of like Patricia Smith and others, like the race, gender, class, it's the trifecta, right? And they intersect, right? And then they extend to even broader realms of like sexuality, religious association, but the anti-capitalist practice, you know, yeah, like bottom line. And the thing though too, is that we can't be exclusive. Like is anti-racism inherently an anti-capitalist practice, an anti-sexist practice, an anti-ageist? Like it all needs to be recognized. You focus on one, you can't dismantle racism while there's fucking child abuse happening, while rape is still occurring, while there's still so much violation to the body or rape of the land. And so I think just extending that, um, like the question to include multiple elements, right? Like anti-racism is then what? Fill in the blank, anti-capitalist. Go down, it just goes down the list. Yeah, but I mean, I think those two are definitely like, you know, sort of inextricably bound because I feel like racism comes out of capitalism, capitalist greed, right? I mean, so race, the, the idea the race construction was you know happened because yes. of you know its need to to you know for for a capitalist practice so like i mean they're like you know they're like this and so yes if we break down one i think we 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 sort of knock down the other as well mm -hmm. and you keep going would anyone else like to Respond to that, Asal, did you have any comments on that one? Well, I thought it was a rhetorical question. I thought. <laughs> <laughs> of course it is, right? I mean, I think, uh, I, think uh, uh, I liked uh, Ty's response where it's, where, you know, it, it's what else was, what else has capital, capitalism done, but, but uh, created ways to funnel, to funnel capital to, into, into smaller, smaller specific places. Um, all owned by um, by white people and white groups of people, and usually white individuals, um, and capture labor, right? Slavery, it's capturing labor, and and monetizing it. So yeah, I mean, it's uh, uh, racism uh, is is intertwined with capitalism, uh, and they both. And at this point, you can't. There's it's hard to see the head and the tail of either one of them. They're both um, uh, pretty much the same thing um, these days. I mean, they're not the same thing, but. They, they feed on each other, of course. So yeah, they're, it's a, they are. 
Yeah. All right. For the sake of time, you know, because time is money, right? <laughs> <laughs> we should end this evening. But I just want to thank you all so much again for taking the time to do this. Um, and everyone who came, thank you for being here and listening to these writers, these thinkers. Hopefully, maybe we have something that we can take away from it. And, you know, as I think all of them would advise, write through the ideas, write through the thoughts that are generating right now in all the friction of, of these people. And maybe we can make something of that. Have a wonderful night, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Maya. Maya. Thank you, everyone. Be safe. Thank you, all. Be Have a nice evening, everyone. Much love, y'all. Peace. Hi, Emma. I just wanted to say I'm, so I'm, I thought that was just awesome. And I'm so glad the staff was there. So I'm an incredible yeah. event. Yeah, good thinkers.